Okay, so um, so hi everyone. So good afternoon. So um, so hi to our in person audience and hello to everybody joining us online. So um, let me just start by saying that um, unfortunately, um, Professor Francesco Preciccioni, who usually hosts these uh, colloquia, uh, isn't able to um, be in person here today due to traveling. And so in his absence, um, I will be uh, hosting the session. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Graham Pleasance. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the, the quantum research group of uh, Professor Preciccioni here at Stellenbosch University. And so um, today I have the pleasure of introducing um, Professor um, Christian muller nederbock who will be um, providing us or delivering a talk on how to build highways in a cell. And before I start, let me um, just briefly read his biography. So um, Professor Christian muller nederbock works in the Department of Physics at Stellenbosch University, where his research is in the field of soft condensed matter and the physics of biological systems at the length scale of cells. Before joining Stellenbosch University, Christian was a postdoctoral research associate at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in Mainz, Germany, which was preceded by his doctoral work in the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge um, in the UK. Um, and so let me also just remind our online participants um, to make use of the Q&A facility. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, then please feel free to type these into the Q&A and hopefully we'll get around to answering these at the, uh, the end of the talk. So. Without any further ado, um, Christian, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for coming and uh, joining the session to listen to the talk. Um, some of you might have heard some of this before, but I hope um, it's going to be a new combination for those who have uh, heard me speak about some of these things before. So uh, the work that I'll be talking about is mainly uh, due to work done by uh, PhD students and a postdoctoral research associate uh, some years ago, uh, Somiado Azorte's work and Stana Mebwe Pashong's work is, um, uh, plays a pivotal role in what I will be presenting today, but you will see other names of persons who are currently still involved with related research projects and um, in the past have been so. A lot of the physics of biological systems that I will tell you about is really inspired by um, really fantastic and inspirational experimental work. You can't dream up the complexity of the physics questions that arise. So um, uh, a lot of these ideas are also explored with uh, Professor Ben Laws in the Department of Physiological Sciences at Stellenbosch University, and you will also hear about uh, some other uh, collaborators from other parts. But let me show you some of the pictures that Ben Laws's students have uh, generated. So um, on the left, on this diagram, you, you see an experiment in which um, Ben's student or postdoctoral researcher, Andre Dutoy, um, took a cell. Um, and in red, you see highlighted uh, a certain part of the cytoskeleton filament structures inside the cell. And whereas if you usually put a cell on a microscope slide, it looks like a fried egg, what they did that was very clever is that they could confine this cell to a certain area on this microscope slide, certain circular areas. So the, the second diagram where you see 30 micrometers, 40 micrometers, and 50 micrometers is just different cells, essentially genetically identical cells, but that are confined in circles of different radii. And the thing that I would like you to notice over there is that actually the red stuff is distributed differently in those different cells. So in the smaller region, everything seems to be on the outside and the periphery of the cell whereas in the largest region, it's sort of spread quite homogeneously. So the cytoskeleton behaves differently depending on how it's confined, and this is one of the physics questions that we'd like to, to, to understand. Um, the, the other images are related to some experiments done at the Rutherford Appleton lab and trying to understand this. Um, but keep that image in mind, um, because Ben and his group have done you know, even more really amazing experiments. So, the cytoskeleton performs a lot of interesting biological functions. Uh, part of it is that they form highways where 
you know, cargoes can be dragged from the outside of the periphery of the cell towards the center or in the opposite direction. So they can serve as transport, not only as mechanical structures. And what you see over here is again, this red kind of network. And there are different objects that are labeled in different co colors in the very clever microscopy that is done. So the, the um, uh, green objects, if I um, uh, get, uh, are called autophagosomes. They're responsible for recycling things inside the cell, and they need to be transported once they've captured the things that they want to recycle. They need to be transported towards somewhere near the center of the cell or towards the nucleus, where there are lysosomes that go and eat up whatever is inside the phagosomes. So there's actually motion of these green objects from one part of the cell to another part of the cell that can be characterized. For that, you need to know something about the structure of the network. So we're really interested in these kinds of um, transport uh, mechanics and the fibers, how they are oriented and where they lie in this cell in order to be able to understand this. So uh, of the many different mechanisms um, in the bottom, you can see just simply an image of an interesting um, microscope uh, image taken um, in the Kriechbaumer lab at Oxford Brookes University, where you have cytoskeletal properties cup, uh, coupled to membranes and other organelles inside the cell. So as physicists, we are interested in these structures, how they move and fluctuate, and uh, whether we can learn anything and predict anything mathematically about this, and hopefully, therefore, um, help in some or other way to capture and understand the physics that is involved in biological processes. So today we're going to be speaking mainly about network-like structures, and there are very different types of, various different types of networks that can be formed when you have these network kind of structures. So typically what you have is in the top right-hand corner is something that's called a crosslink, a typical network structure that you'd have in a car tire, something like that. Whereas um, inside cells, um, you will have certain types of filamentous structures to which we'll get more detail later that will create kind of tree-like structures. And actually, here's a, here's a famous image. You'll see it everywhere on Wikipedia and on many different presentations on biological physics, um, where they're labeling two different types of networks in red and green that occur in a cell. I think actually the colors are switched around to the ones that I used previously, but in any case, there are several structures that uh, emerge in the cell that consist of filaments that grow autonomously, that can serve as mechanical, uh, as, as mechanical networks, or that can um, trans uh, also serve as the highways for transport inside these cells. So we are, we are interested in thinking about the properties of these networks. What happens if you squish the cell or you pull on a cargo or you take those images, a sequence of images in the microscopy? And of course, since I'm a theoretical physicist, I do this in the simplest possible way, ignoring the extreme complexity of these biological systems most of the time. So here's a cartoon of one of these types of filaments. So what was originally labeled in red um, is it, were microtubules in those original images of those confined networks. The microtubules are sort of assembled helical tubes that are relatively stiff. They uh, assemble and can disassemble inside the cell, um, controlled by various parameters, um, 24 nanometers in di uh, diameter, consisting of smaller dimers. So here's one component of those networks. Another component of those networks that we'll be speaking about is a different kind of fiber, and you immediately see it's it's not quite it's still helical, but not quite as strongly helical. It's a structure with uh, a far smaller diameter, and these are called actin filaments. And in both of these cases, these filaments have a sense of direction attached to them. So uh, I'll be indicating this throughout my talk. These like, sort of conic structures that that I show in these cartoons of these filaments. Why do we need to think about these objects as oriented? Because they grow differently on one end and the other end, and the molecular machines for which they serve as highways can actually identify the arrows in which, 
uh, associated with these filaments. So these are not, you know, uh, these are not symmetrical objects from the left and the right as you see them. Okay. Originally, uh, the, the first set of images I showed you was this idea about confining something, uh, the, the, the filament structure of the cell in, in different sizes of volumes. So many years ago, um, Arash Azari did a, 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 an interesting computer simulation of, of polymer structures, not anything as fancy as the filaments that you have seen, in spherical confinement. So here you see in the part of the diagram labeled B is four different chains, polymer chains, which exist inside, a spherically conf uh, inside spherical confinement. Now, they're labeled with different colors over here. So there's a light blue, and then there's a dark blue. And the only difference between any of these chains is that they have different segment lengths that are stiffer. So in terms of stiffness is the only thing that's different between these chains. Every single bead or monomer on these chains sees every other monomer in the system with exactly the same um, interaction. So they're exactly the same forces between all of the beads in, the, in, in these chains, um, between the red ones and the blue ones and the yellow ones and the green ones, etc. So all the forces are the same. The only thing that's different is how they're connected uh, and how stiff they are. And so here's a movie that just and gives you an idea of how confinement can play a role in these kinds of systems. So these are snapshots of molecular dynamics computer simulations, and you will see that the, the, the sphere starts shrinking at some point and that these filaments start rearranging. And keep an eye on keep your eye on the on the dark blue ones, which are the ones that have the longest stiff segments. And eventually, when you confine the segment, the, confine these segments, you can see that as you make the sphere smaller and smaller, there's a kind of arrangement of these filaments, just simply not because of their interactions, but because of the stiffness that they have. And eventually, it looks, looks like this tight ball of wool or something like that. And the, the blue, the stiffest ones, are sitting towards the outside. Okay. So this can certainly be measured in different ways. You have various graphs over here. They're quite difficult to interpret, but what you can see on the left-hand side of, of the screen is just simply the different diameters of the spheres, which I have circled from 50 up to 14 um, units of uh, the Jones length. And if you take a look at the, the blue line corresponding to the stiffest segments, the ones that you saw eventually set on the surface of the sphere, you can immediately see that that effect is copied over there. When you take the bottom right-hand uh, image over there, the, the longest segments all go and sit towards the surface, or the inside of the surface of that sphere. So this is just simply the data that shows this, and we can measure a few other things. So there's a problem for a theoretical physicist when you're thinking about the kind of filaments that are inside cells. First of all, uh, as you might have realized, there's some kind of stiffness, some kind of persistence. They're not completely wob wobbly objects. And some filaments are stiff on the length scale of the diameter of the cell. Other filaments are much more flexible, and so they're not stiff or rod-like on the length scale of the cells if you measure the diameter. When you further confine them in a region, we find very quickly that the, the sort of historically useful mathematical tools that one has used can take from soft condensed matter physics or the physics of polymers don't necessarily always work so well. There are many very clever and very good approximations, but it's, it's a theoretically hard region to access and write closed equations for. That's, of course, why you also saw us doing a lot of computer simulations. So we were wanting to describe already for, for quite a while, starting in 2003 and eventually in 2019, how does one think about the kind of confinement of stiff molecules in cells and how can one establish a good theoretical paradigm that helps us to write down some, some good closed form equations, at least to some degree? This And this is the idea of a monomer ensemble where we think about the polymers 
as they do in biological systems as growing and shrinking and adding bonds at a certain end. So you see the, the light red attaching to the other reds. There's a certain likelihood that they attach given by Z, and there's a certain penalty for how much they bend. Okay. And what it turns out happens in these systems is that we can actually write down closed form integral equations for the partition function, other kinds of physics quantities that we want to describe, but also that really help us to tell, to, to learn how many bonds there are, uh, where this kind of polymer is inside the cell. So we want to predict, you know, does more of it sit on the surface or in the center, for example, and how is it oriented so that we know something about these highways. And the useful thing about this formalism is very analogously to, um, as it turns out, to certain formalism from quantum mechanics, one can start writing specific functions that are easy to solve. But the basic idea is the simple idea of what I've circled or, or included in an ellipse over here in, in, in red or blue, is that one can write a kind of diagrammatic technique, a kind of instruction for how do you build one of these objects. So if you want to build a filament of an arbitrary length, and in statistical physics, you need to sum over every single possibility, every single possible filament that the system has, there is the possibility of a single filament added to a single filament plus the rest of the system. And if you substitute this back in itself, this kind of graph equation, the little bubble with the arrow, and you replace it, you, you end up with the sum over all possible lengths of filaments. Now, this is not, not terribly hard. Um, and it turns out that this is a very useful way to write some of these equations, which allows one to in certain circumstances, solve this analytically, and others relatively trivially on a computer without having to do a computer simulation, but just simply a calculation. Um, why is this important? Because it comes to interesting networks. And the first thing we see is that if these filaments are very stiff, depending on their stiffness, they will go and sit on the outside of a, a, a confined region. So this is the equivalent of these red cells uh, of these red filaments that you saw from the real cells originally gives you some kind of density distribution and where the graph is the highest it shows you that the filaments that most of the, the filament monomers are there um, and one can play various kinds of games and and start introducing this to networks so this is work somiado did uh, if you have statistically lots of short filaments rattling around in the box they're going to be relatively evenly distributed. So that group blue graph is just sort of at the top. So everything's you know, nicely distributed inside um, a, a certain container. If you have a long object, but it's very bendy, you, know, you have a garden hose, which you need to put into a cinema, you can still distribute it rather homogeneously in our cinema. And you, you have you know, not, not a very spectacular graph. Perhaps most of it is a little bit more in the middle but otherwise, nothing fantastic happens. But now imagine if you want to put um, a piece of wire inside a soccer ball or something like that. It's going to sit around the outside. So if you have an object that's very stiff, you're going to wind it around like that, and it's going to touch the balls very easily. So the physics of all of the, the, the fancy maths and the Feynman diagrams that we do, what it predicts is simply, you know, what we already intuitively know about how you're going to, if you're going to put a stiff object inside a tiny little container, it's statistically going to sit around the sides. Great. And so, um, uh, Christel Hoes, who did an MSc, completed an MSc two years ago, um, looked at this uh, from a variety of different perspectives. It did very detailed uh, computer calculations for two and three dimensional systems. And he also, plotted something that's, that we call an order parameter, something about the orientations of these filaments. Now, there are different ways in which these filaments can be oriented. You saw that in the previous picture over here, for example, the filament more or less oriented parallel to the sides. Are there situations where it's more like a broomstick inside a room and where it's pointing towards the walls? And this is what the order parameters uh, could uh, sort of distinguish. 
So in these graphs, you will see not only the density distribution on the left sides of all of these columns of graphs, but also something telling us that something about the distribution of the orientation. I won't go on about that because what we want to do is we want to build networks, more complicated networks. And here is a network that is forming, and these are actin networks. There's something called the ARP23 complex that causes branches at close to around 70 degrees. Okay? And these branches can be pruned and they fall off and do all kinds of things. But what you get is a kind of tree-like structure that also occurs in the cell. Well, not all networks are tree-like structures, but it happens that th these specific filaments, actin filaments, and ARP23 can form these kinds of tree-like structures. And tree-like structures, for somebody who's worked on polymer networks for a long time, are much easier than the other kinds of networks, because they usually don't include closed loops. Okay, so I'm just contrasting this. A tree that grows with branching is different to a network where things are glued together as on the right side over there. So now we can take our funny graph-like um, structures and write them out again and build all possible networks mathematically that can occur in this system. And here is one of the prescriptions in which we can possibly do that. So at the, the, the topmost graph is just a reminder of what I showed you previously. So there's the, the, the bubble with the arrow, which you substitute it on the right-hand side uh, over and over again, you will get all possible lengths of polymer, boring. But if you include that it can grow as a polymer, but also branch as in the, the second scenario over here, you can generate all possible kinds of branching networks. And you can weight them by how they bend and what it costs to be stiff, etc. So we can create the networks, as you will see, include as you can see, included in the green bit over here, you can create possible networks and do the statistical physics that's associated with this. And try to figure out, you know, what does it mean? How do these networks grow? And so, two interesting things happen. One inter or, well, a few interesting things happen, again, if one thinks about them, perhaps not spectacular. So, remember now, we have networks where there's some kind of stiffness, you want to pack them in a confined space, but there's now a different kind of stiffness included. There's a stiffness of branching and the stiffness of the filaments. And if you have a very stiff tree, which you want to put into a very small space, sometimes the branches stick perpendicular into the surface into which they want to stick. So if you want to put your Christmas tree in a plastic bag, it's going to poke a lot of holes in it, okay? Um, uh, but if you have a tree with, with long, bendy branches, you, know, you, you might get it into some other container when the branches bend around. And so what we are able to do in terms of these kinds of parameters and these networks and the sizes of the network, Somiado was able to figure out you know, that there's actually a kind of phase diagram. It's not a real phase diagram. It's different ways in which the systems behave, which you can tune the lengths of the branches which is given on the um, vertical axis versus uh, the density to uh, the density to branch, which is tuned on the horizontal axis. You find these three specific domains corresponding to whether your branches, whether your tree fills the network, whether most of it is near the surface, and whether at the when it's at the surface, the branches are sticking into the surface or are aligning parallel to it. So we can identify these kinds of sources and therefore refine the picture at the start in which, which Ben. And so to continue this and put these kinds of trees into all kinds of interesting geometrical objects and, and figure out their orientation and so on. Even more so, we can now take this tree and we can sit on our Christmas tree in the plastic bag and see with how much force it responds. You know, the, the cell is a mechanical object, at least from the perspective of a physi physicist. It resists some force, which comes in part from the cytoskeleton. So what happens if you shear or if you want to deform this, this uh, structure as it forms? And indeed, one can do it. We can make these trees grow and grow into deformed structures, deform the structures after they have grown. Um, but these are 
trees that are de deformed, that, that grow in deformed structures, we can compare how much energy and entropy and free energy it costs to make these trees, and therefore calculate a Young's modulus for deforming these objects, which you see over here. There's some interesting things. For example, if you shear the cell, so you have a box, and you simply just move the top surface relative to the bottom surface, so this corresponds to the graph that you see in the bottom right-hand side, um, depending on how your network has formed, the, the shear modulus increases to a peak and then decreases again. We're wondering about this really strange behavior over here. Why does it go up and go down? But um, in the end, what we found, and I haven't shown you the data over here, is at a certain point, there is precisely a very, very stable, mechanically stable network that grows, that grows from one side of the box to the other side of the box and it's like like a strut in a door that keeps the whole system stable for a while once the the strut grows too long it starts bending around becomes softer again so there are certain trees um, um, make the whole system mechanically stable i'm going to skip this because i'm running out of time so if you want to form networks you can also do other things you can cross link them when you cross link them the big question that influences the mechanics is all of this stuff is at a finite temperature. It's in a liquid, uh, water in the, in the cell. And when one molecule moves, every other molecule moves connected to it. So the whole physics of this motion is really complicated. And how does one enumerate this? Well, again, one needs to do the kind of statistical physics. So in addition to thinking about in how many ways trees can form, you now need to figure out in how many different ways these crosslinks, you can glue the network together and assign the usual statistical probabilities to it. Um, and, and that turns out to be complicated, but you can write some really nice theories of which Nadine, for example, is, is, is busy at this point. And you know, one can start figuring out what happens if you've got hands to hold on and gluing things together. Uh, I think, again, I'll we skip over, uh, it's hardly worthwhile to, to point out the maths over here. This is scary maths if one's writing something like statistical physics, because everything inside the exponential looks highly nonlinear, and it, it really is highly nonlinear. Luckily, in spite of all of its horrible nonlinearity, one can deal with it quite nicely, surprisingly, uh, through a saddle point, which has a unique and interesting solution. So even in this kind of problem where we were thinking of particles that can form networks by holding onto each other, we had two types of networking particles, micelles with 10 hands and another one with 42 hands that could hold onto each other. You get a really nonlinear equation with powers of 42 and powers of 10 in there. And it turns out that of all of the possible saddle point equations, there's only exactly one physical one, and it corresponds to something quite sensible and tells you when this network uh, emerges or collapses or is stable. Okay. So this is the really boring bit about you know, the bio biological system, because all of this was equilibrium statistical physics. Now, you probably came here because at least I said something about the, the machines on the highways and so on. And so we really need to think about the more and fascinating, complicated behavior that occurs as time evolves in a living system. And um, there's a huge field in biological physics or physics and in applied mathematics all the uh, theory of active systems is in which you have you know, individual agents such as molecular machines or something else that moves and that interact by relatively simple rules but cause complicated behavior. Um, so one of, uh, one of these kinds of situations, I haven't included a video over here, but you've probably seen these interesting videos of where they show the murmurations of starlings a flock of starlings and there's this cloud of starlings that swirls around in an interesting kind of pattern and everybody knows that there's no head starling that commands all of the other 2,000 members of the flock or how many it, it is um, to, to change direction something like that so there must be some simple rule of how the starlings decide individually to fly based on what 
they see in their vicinity. And so um, the murmurations of starlings, of these individual agents that interact with other agents but are moving in the system, then form these interesting patterns and structures that evolve over time. Um, one of these is quite a classic model, is called the Vikshek model, formulated in 1995. Um, and um, I'll show you what a computer simulation of this does. Below you see a ballroom of one of the royal palaces in Dresden, where I suppose people were also doing some kind of murmuration activities at some stage. So what you have is, uh, you, you'll see just the results of some very simple computer simulations of systems in, in which these arrows move in the direction in which they point. And within a specific radius, they change their orientation depending on the other arrows that are within a given radius. So you have this Vic check model, and you see that there are few arrows, and they're all moving around. They sometimes interact, but there's no real pattern that you can see. Uh, what happens is, at some point, I make these arrows the, this radius a little bit bigger, or I make them move more slowly. And you can see different kinds of collective structures emerge. It's all the same simple rules. You're just changing some of the parameters of the radius and the strength of interaction over here to, to start seeing that there's some kind of dynamical ordering going on over here. And so, you know, there's really a lot of interesting physics that one wants to you know, explain in these, um, uh, understand from these kinds of simulations and where one uses these ideas in a variety of different systems. So there's lots of, there are lots of molecular machines inside uh, a cell. They interact with each other via a whole lot of processes that we don't understand. And they, they, they give, bring about these dynamical structures that change with time and these patterns that we want to understand that are probably relevant to the process of these living parts of living organisms. Um, and so we return to something far simpler than these kinds of collective processes, and we're thinking about the idea of simple molecular machines. A motor inside a cell that walks along a filament, and I'll show you a cartoon of some of these in a moment, that then moves along. So here is the idea of a, let's have to start this simulation again. Um, it's not a simulation. It's, it's post-it notes on a black background. Um, and you're supposed to watch the red particle. And here's an idea of something that's called a flashing ratchet. How do you rectify Brownian motion? How do you produce how do you let the red particle, for example, move preferably towards the left rather than the right in a way uh, that makes use of the fact that the system is in a thermal environment? And so, um, so you can see it diffuses around to the left and the right with the equal probability, and then you change the background potential in which it moves. And as you change the background potential, there's a slight drift of this. You know, if you're going to be doing the honor statistical physics course in the second term. You'll be looking at some of this kind of drift, and it drifts towards the left-hand side, and eventually the particle will move to the left. And although, and certainly the mechanisms uh, of the real sort of machines that live inside our cells are more complicated, it's sort of the basis of how people have been thinking at least in one of the terms, one of the mechanisms of how molecular motors work. So inside our cells, there are machines such as kinesins. Now they, they have two feet and go and sit on this thing called the microtubule. Remember the microtubule, like all of those other filaments that we spoke about, has an arrow associated with it, and the feet know in which the arrow points. And so this microtubule in this rather bad cartoon can step forward, and it actually supposedly looks a little bit like a human with two legs stepping forward. Now it can move backwards and forwards. There are other motors called dynines that move in the opposite direction, kinds of stepping motions. 
what you also have is the other kinds of filaments. I showed you that there were other ones that were not microtubules, but the actin filaments, the ones that are slightly bendier and not quite as strongly helically formed. Um, they have other motors called myosins, and there are quite a lot of different myosins um, that actually go and can also produce motion along this filament. So over here you see the motor, non-processive motor, which attaches and detaches and attaches at a different part of the filament, point, pulling it in a certain direction. So these tiny protein motors that use um, ATP hydrolysis to convert energy in a thermal environment inside a cell and produce motion. They can drag along cargo, they can push filaments around, etc. And so what happens, again, is that these motors can cooperate. Here's an example of something that's called a motility assay, where you have motors that are tethered to a substrate. This is an experimentally realizable system, not one which I have made, uh, only theoretically, that is, um, but uh, it's experimentally realizable. And these motors that attach and detach a filament all pull in the same direction and then can collectively push this filament around in this motility assay, making it move. At the same time, it can reorient what I haven't shown there. It can bend and do various kinds of things. So we, these motors can produce motions and produce forces inside the cell to move things about. And this immediately changes the nature of, of how we think about these networks. So if we have a motor a pair that cross-links two filaments but decides to move in opposite directions, it starts stretching things and introducing new forces and changing the whole structure and the dynamics of this kind of network. Again, just a bad cartoon, nothing like this. So Mohamed Matiisi looked at this many years ago, for example, and figuring out how the forces and the elastic responses of these networks can change. But today I want to tell you a story which is very speculative about the contractile ring. Now, um, the uh, during cell division, the genetic material is copied, brought to two parts of the two sides of the cell, and a contractile ring forms around the equator of the cell, pinching off, uh, contracting and pinching off the membrane, turning the originally single cell, now with the reproduced genetic information, into um, two separate cells. The contractile ring is part of this, um, this process of cell division in the sense that it, it, it produces precisely this moment in which the membrane of the cell is, 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 is pinched off in order to form two separate cells. Now, there are, there are hugely clever experiments that have you know, taken a look at this part of the process. I don't know how these experiments work in any detail whatsoever, but um, what one has is this ring that's forming and you see it from the side. And if you take a look at that diagram, there are red and blue um, uh, filaments in there and a green and a yellow one, which I've just highlighted for the purpose of highlighting them. But the red and blue filaments are just simply filaments whose arrows point in different directions. So at one stage, these filaments are formed, they interdiffuse, and you have got ones that point with their arrows pointing in a clockwise and ones that point with their arrows pointing in an anti-clockwise direction. What we do know, apart from probably some other things, is that molecular machines seem to be involved in this process. Okay? And what we do know is that the contractile ring does what its name says, is that it contracts at some point, so its radius changes. But these filaments of actin and myosin motors that might connect them, certainly might be other things going on, and you should not forget that the filaments can still grow and shrink, which we completely ignore. And one can ask, you know, how do, does this active machinery produce the kind of force that causes this ring to contract and pinch off that membrane? And so what we're proposing is definitely not the only explanation, but uh, relating to uh, a very simple question and some simple ideas. 
how we think about these molecular machines. So here I've highlighted the, those blue and the, the red filaments, and they're just different in terms of which direction their arrow shows. Sorry, it's not quite visible on the slide. In green is a molecular machine that cross-links them. And so you're seeing different uh, snapshots of time um, uh, from top to bottom on the left-hand side over there. So with those different snapshots of time, uh, remember that the molecular motor will want to step in the direction of the arrow, whatever we decide to call it. So the motor that's attached to the blue one at the top wants to step statistically at least towards the right, and the, the, bit of the motor that's attached to the red arrow will want to step to the left. And so in the middle diagram, you see it having, having taken those two steps, which now stretches the little motor bond, which is like a spring, and so it wants to, wants to shorten again, and once it shortens again, it moves these two filaments past each other. So if the filaments are in opposite directions, the motor would tend to push the one filament past the other filament. This is in contrast to the right-hand side where the two uh, filaments are pointing the same direction. If a motor connects them, the motor takes a step towards the right on the top and a step towards the right on the bottom. It doesn't push them past each other. They just sort of stay more or less aligned. And then the motor eventually proceeds to the tip and perhaps it falls off, perhaps it sticks, we don't know. So here's one ingredient. If the arrows point in opposite directions, the motors want to push them past each other. If they're in the same direction, the motors don't really do anything like pushing the, the two filaments past each other. There's another ingredient in trying to understand this, and that depends on the amount of overlap that these two filaments have. So you see uh, three different pictures. Uh, in the top one, there are the filaments completely overlap in their length. So there's space for a lot of these motors to come and go and sit between these two filaments. If the, when the overlap becomes smaller, there are fewer motors. So if each motor pushes with a certain force F, uh, the fewer motors there are in between, the less force can be developed between these filaments. So the force also depends on the degree of overlap, not only the orientation. Of this. So the PhD student Stannard actually did this and she took a look at it and wrote equations for it, did a, a collective coordinate kind of um, calculation, but she also did Langevin dynamics, computer simulations for this. And here you, you, you see some of this simulation to, to see what happens in these, um, in these rings. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a question that we, we really need to worry about and where the answer that is sometimes given when one doesn't um, think too long about it is quite glib. Many people say, would say the first thing about the contractile ring is that these active motors make the ring contract. If you think about it, that can't be quite true because all it does is it pushes the filaments past each other. So it just makes them counter rotate doesn't want to make the length of the ring shorter. So um, we need to think about adding the idea of making the length of the ring shorter, and that is indeed this overlap idea. The more the filaments overlap, the, the better and tighter the forces are, the more the advantages of the motors attaching. And this is indeed what um, Stannard did in her simulations. So. On the left-hand side, you see a little bit of an animation of a very simple simulation. There are red and blue dots corresponding again to a red and blue arrows. I'll show you the simulation in a moment again. And what we have is so this contractile ring, and we're showing the, the, the filaments as they're, they're moving around, counter-rotating on this ring due to the motor forces. And at one stage, you will have seen above there that I, I changed... Um, the slider on activity, the second slider above, that's the, the slider for the active force, the force that these motors produce, the one, the force that pushes them past each other. Um, if I go back, I can start this again. Yes. Um, you see that if the active force, the force of the motors, is large enough, the, the dots move more or less homogeneously around the ring. 
as soon as I reduce this active force, the activity, what you see is, as I've turned it off, is that the particles stop moving, the current comes zero, and the ring breaks because all of the particles bunch up on one side. So the, the contractile ring loses its integrity. This gives one possible explanation of how to think about the contractile ring. So the active force doesn't make the ring contract because that's the degree of overlap, the typical networking forces that you think about, the ones that we've been speaking about in other respects in this, this presentation. What does the active force do? It actually just simply mixes up this ring fast enough so that it doesn't break apart. And so you've got the active force, which is not you know, necessarily producing the force that's making the ring contract, but it's, just, it's keeping its integrity there. So here's one theoretical physicist's interpretation of this. And um, uh, 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 the, the graph on the right-hand side of this figure just simply shows that uh, the networking strength and the filament current are, are related to each other. And that, um, as you will see with the red versus the blue graphs, they have different strengths of these, um, of these motor forces. So um, you'd need, um, you have a, a system that breaks far later, in the case of the red one, where the active force is higher. OK. And with that, I'd like to complete the lecture. Um, thank all of the wonderful people who have done this work, and we are continuing to do it. Um, and to all of the experimental collaborators whose images inspire many of these ideas of complicated experiments, but relatively simple-minded theory, which is hard enough um, uh, throughout, and for, for generating many of the interesting pictures that you saw. Um, if you're interested in other things, such as the geometry and transport of organelles in cells, um, topological invariance in polymer physics, you can speak with me later. Thanks very much for coming and listening. Thank you, uh, Christian, for that um, very interesting talk. Um, so now we can come to the questions. So let's start with our in-person audience, perhaps. So do we have any uh, questions for Christian? Feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. <laughs> oh, yes, we have one question. Yeah. yeah, thank you for a very nice talk and interesting talk. Um, it with the, I wanted to ask you with the um, uh, images at the beginning where you have the sort of less stiff and more stiff polymers. Can you sort of understand that in terms of um, entropic forces that the things that are more stiff don't really care that much about entropy and the things that are sort of more floppy want to concentrate near the center yeah. so then the um, stiffer stuff um, it costs more free energy to for them to sort of exclude volume near the center so that's why they get pushed out and form that pattern. I just want to know, is that yes, sort of yes, on uh, the right track? Yeah, yes, you're, you're definitely on the right track. It's definitely an entropic effect uh, associated with, with these flexible and less flexible uh, elements in, in these bonds. So, so in, indeed, you know, the, the system is still extremizing the, the, that free energy and, and the entropy is, is, is pivotal there, yes. Yeah. Can I just ask a sort of second completely different question? I was really impressed with those um, images at the very beginning. Could you maybe tell us a little more about how they were taken? Was it an electron microscope? Oh. The resolution looks incredibly high. <laughs> um, um, I must say, um, I probably need to defer to, to my colleagues who took the images. No, the, these are optical microscopes images um 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 yeah yeah, uh, so, yeah so one of them on the right hand side is, is taken in a light sheet microscope and these are confocal and some of them are I, i'm not quite sure whether these are on the super resolution microscopes so what they have of course is they have um uh various 
kinds of uh, uh, fluorophore labels, colleagues from laser physics should help me, um, that, that, that selectively attach to certain of the, 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 the proteins in the system or the filaments. So they're little light bulbs that can light up. And so uh, although these cells are, of course, full of a whole range of other stuff, you can essentially have these little labels attached to specific bits of the cell. And so you can target them, excite them with the right frequency, laser light, and then uh, you know, th there's always some image processing involved in order to to um, then have these microscope images. But with these, so, they're not mi these are not electron microscope images. Because the images look like it's a small fraction of a micron, you know, much shorter than yes. the wavelength of light, the resolution exactly. that's been achieved. So, so the field has really been revolutionized by the microscopy techniques that have really become available in the past decade and a half, I suppose. Peter, would that be right? Yes, Bertrand, yeah. Um, uh, and um, a whole range of, of different microscopy techniques, um, ways of um, really, you know, breaking the idea that there's, you know, that you shouldn't be able to see anything that's smaller than the wavelength of the light with which you're imaging. So you can really go well beyond that. All of them have their inherent challenges, uh, et cetera, and I'm not the expert to, to, to know anything about it, but it, there, there's really a whole range of absolutely fantastic techniques that really help us uh, to, to start understanding these systems at really tiny length scales um, that were inconceivable you know, a couple of decades ago. Thanks a lot. Are there any other, other questions from our, from our audience in person? Okay, thanks Christian for this nice talk. Um, in, the in the part where you were considering filaments within a cavity, okay, so I, I think with, with one exception where you looked at the sheared uh, cavity, it was always a um, static cavity. Yes. Are there any ideas of how to, for example, include some back reaction from the the filaments onto the cavity, how the cavity can change? We, we're not quite sure precisely. So, so you're thinking about what happens if, for example, you, you have a cavity that's, that's an elastic cavity or a membrane or membrane, something. For, like for example, um, well, the wall um, cell is not really stiff. I mean, yes. Um, so uh, plant cells might might work because they have a cell wall and, and that's relatively uh, rigid. Um, no, um, there, there are some ideas, but not not any ones that. Well, put one for example. Case with us, there are probably other can, people. Can introduce some deformation parameter and then calculate the free energy and find a favorable deformation parameter. Something like that, yes. You, you, you'd there couple... be a free energy as the, the f a function of the shape of the cavity, exactly, and yes, then one yes. can use that as a, a potential or, yes. or something like yes. that. You, you'd, you'd couple the fluctuations of the, 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 the cavity or the membrane around to the fluctuations of, of the, the polymers inside, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? If we don't have any more in-person questions, I see that there's two questions from our online uh, audience. Um, I don't know the best way to, to go. I don't have a laptop, so I can't see them. <laughs> but uh, Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, we have a question here. Is confinement self-organized? What could be the cause of confinement? So in, in the... In the, in the... In the cell, it's just simply the, the, the structure. So the, the cell is surrounded by a cell membrane. So there, there's a kind of confinement or the cell is inside a tissue, which gives the membrane some shape. If you, as I, as I just mentioned in response to Herbert's question, you know, if you're thinking about plant cells, they have quite a rigid cell membrane, which is, which is uh, really hard. So, so all of the, the 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 filaments and everything are almost contained in this kind of box-like structure that has a certain shape. So it, it's given by the rest of the system in this case. And then there's a more general question about the slides. Are the slides available? Uh, they include links. I would like to just click on learn more about the topic. I'm 
I don't know. I think I think that the presentations are made available um, as a standard via via Netex's. Um, Assuming it, it gets uploaded on YouTube, but I don't know about the slides specifically. But uh, otherwise, the questioner can can email me. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, if there's no further questions, then um, let me just finish up by presenting our speaker with a nice gift from Netex. So um, it look, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it looks interesting. So thank you, thank you again.